Hello there, all of you event planners and future event planners. This week, we have an amazing guest, Jamie Cohen, who is a communication coach and advisor and the creator of The Right Words. She is also a LinkedIn instructor on video communication. So with that, thank you so much, Jamie, for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks. Could you expand a little bit on what your LinkedIn course was? Because I, I know I've, I've gone through some of the sessions. Um, but yeah, for the audience, could you explain what that's about and, and how that might be useful in a digital event, for instance? Sure, absolutely. So um, just a little bit of a background on uh, how I got started with, with LinkedIn Learning is that LinkedIn Learning used to be called lynda.com and it was purchased by LinkedIn some years back. And a couple of years ago, I went to... I went to VidCon, the biggest video conference in the world, and um, met some of the team from LinkedIn Learning. And we just really hit it off. I told them what I was working on, what I was doing, and they talked about us doing a course together. But I, at that point in time, I wasn't really ready to take the step. And then the next year, I was speaking at VidCon about live video. I was one of the live video beta testers for LinkedIn and reconnected with them and then ended up putting together this course called connecting with your audience using video and specifically for LinkedIn. Um, so the video is a, it's some, there's a little bit of something for everyone. It's great for beginners. It's great for people who have used video for a while, but want to take their presence to the next level. And really what it's doing is teaching you how to feel comfortable and confident on camera. And what's more is take a one to many experience, which is using this video um, and connecting with all these people and making it feel like it's a one-on-one -on -one experience. So if you think of any YouTubers or you think of other video creators on other platforms who you might follow, when for the ones who are really talented, you feel like you have a relationship with them. When they're looking into the camera, it feels like they're looking into your eyes. And if they're speaking in such a way that you feel empowered and inspired, you feel like that's a connection that you too share alone, even without knowing this person. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good way to put it. And so, you know, you were doing LinkedIn Live Beta. So how would you say that experience would differ um, from just, a, you know, a, a recorded video? Because I, I think that's been a really big lesson for a lot of people in 2020. They wanted to pre-record and have semi-live events uh, where everything was kind of canned. Do you think live experience versus uh, a canned kind of recording, which would you say is better for communication? I don't think one is better than the other, but it requires different muscles. You have to flex different muscles and it requires a different skill set. So when you are recording pre-recorded content for a lot of people, even people who are great public speakers, people who are confident, that can be extremely daunting because they're used to looking into the faces of their audience or into the eyes of a friend. And now suddenly you have to look into this little tiny little dot that's in front of you and you have to, you feel like you have to perform. And that's what happens with a lot of people instead of this sort of natural communication that we're used to, even though on stage it might be a little bit performative, it's still a conversation with another warm body. Um, you suddenly have to, a lot of people just turn on. They think the cameras turn on and they have to change their posture and they have to change their facial expressions and they have to change their voice and they become this very robotic sort of person, which isn't something that we can connect with. I mean, I think we all can connect with the experience of feeling uncomfortable, but video is this amazing way to connect, but also this form of escapism where we're able to have this experience with another person and let the world fall away and let our experiences of the day just leave those behind and have a conversation, even though with video, sometimes it's one-sided on the pre-recorded side. So just to bring it all back, they're just different skills. So for people who are not used to being on camera when you're pre-recording, a lot of people are worried about how they look and how they sound. Yeah. And they're, this feeling of perfectionism that some of us deal with, but a lot of us have experienced comes to play. And we're even sometimes when I'm making video and I've been making video for years since, since I, I was a teenager, I've just always loved making videos. Um, and we're like taking 10, 20, 30 takes. And by the time you're done, you've taken so many takes that everything just seems like a total mess. And you're like, why did I even do this? And so I always 
I always recommend to people who are not comfortable right away is having someone in the room with you when you're having a conversation or just, I mean, having someone in the room with you to make it conversational or even taking a picture of a friend and posting it next to your camera. So it oh, feels yeah. like that. it feels like you're speaking to someone versus then let's say the live side where you have people watching you and you, you have engagement. So humans are really big on feedback. And when you're live and hopefully you have some people watching your live stream, you might have some people like you see the number of people that are watching and maybe some people are engaging in the comments you feel more as though you're having a conversation. So that that can be a lot less stressful for people. And I know for me, I seem I do better when I'm live because then it feels more like I'm just, like I said, having a communication with the people that I'm speaking with. Yeah, and I think I would love your thoughts on this. You know, two things come to mind. When you do a live stream, you don't agonize over your mistake. You have to push through and move on. And I mm -hmm. think there is a lower tendency, in my experience at least, uh, when I pre-record videos and they're just me as a talking head, I I lose all of my energy by take 32 when I'm finally thinking I did it well, right? And so the energy drop off is just incredible. Um, I I would love your your thoughts on how do you how do you maintain that energy and what's the difference in energy and um, that that just kind of different feeling when you walk into a live stream. So. I like to get pumped up and like maybe put some music on, maybe do some like funny vocal exercises. If you've seen Anchorman, how he does unique New York. <laughs> um, and uh, just getting, getting, getting yourself warmed up. Um, also something, something that I haven't done, but a lot of my live streaming friends do is to stand up when you're doing live video. So if you have a standing desk or if you can put your camera or your computer on a counter and you can stand up, um, you can stand up in front of the video, then you are using more of your muscles so you're more awake and you can keep that energy going. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, I found it's better for your diaphragm too. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, Just like singing. Exactly, yeah, actually, uh, um, a singer songwriter friends, the one who told me to do it. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, when we talk about the audio and the video and we, we talk about how this presentation looks on the video, what, what would you kind of say are the, the big, um, the big keys to good communication? It's really hard to, you know, reach through the camera and, and shake your hand or, you know, have a hug or those other things. So how do, how do we make up for that in a digital space while we're, we're all in kind of these boxes? So for, for digital events, validation is something that's really important, something that we don't think about enough. And when we are on camera, we, while we're able to see some body language, but not too much, because like you can see with both of us, it's just the chest up. So you can't always see us gesticulating. You can't, you can't necessarily determine what our energy level is or the energy that we're sending out by our body positioning. But what you can see is our face. And what you can hear is the way that we modulate our voice. So when we're having a normal conversation and especially I'm someone who is, I'm definitely a, a culprit when it comes to this, I can be a little bit monotone when I'm having a conversation. So something to consider when you're in when you're in a um, a meeting, when you're at a digital event, is being cognizant of modulating your voice and exaggerating. And it can feel really silly because if you're just talking to a friend, if you're just spending time with people, even if you are presenting, you're not necessarily used to making a lot of facial expressions or changing the tone of your voice. And so I offer some exercises to people who are not used to doing that. So I can go through it really quick. It's just a short exercise. Sure, I'd love um, it. <laughs> but so I, I have, I know a lot of people, and this is something I actually do with my clients too, um, who, who tell interesting stories, but, if you weren't able to see their face, you wouldn't you wouldn't get the same effect because the way that they speak is a little bit flat, which is okay normally. But when you're on camera, you don't have to turn on, but there is this performative aspect in order to really connect with people. And also when we're at events and there's so many people, you wanna capture the attention of your audience. So if you're not used to speaking with a lot of modulation or changing a pitch in your voice, I suggest 
talking like this, having, having a few sentences that you practice and just changing, changing the level. So for instance, this is, I'll just say the sentence in a few different ways. So um, I went to the park and pet a cute dog. So there, you can hear there's some modulation in my voice, but that's pretty flat versus I went to the park and I saw a dog. That's more exciting. And, but that's still like, a, seeing a dog at the park is exciting for me, so I'm modulating. But if you're not sure how to get from A to B, this is an exercise I suggest. So we're going to say the same sentence again, but it's going to sound really funny. So I say, I went to the park and I saw a dog and I went to the park and I saw a dog and I went to the park and I saw a dog. So you're feeling your voice going up and down and up and down. And so you're feeling what it you're hearing and feeling what it sounds like to change the pitch of your voice. And so that, so obviously you wouldn't do that when you're at the event, <laughs> but this is something you can practice. So that way, when you, when you go to the event and you are speaking and you're having a conversation or you're presenting, then you feel more comfortable with that modulation because you've done something that feels so outlandish and so different to you that you are, you're able to speak in this more interesting way and it doesn't feel uncomfortable it feels more normal yeah that's a great tip you know there's a lot of discussion around intonation right now um i you know i think sound is is <laughs> overvalued in some respects and undervalued in others there was a recent study uh or it came to light in 2020 there was a study from 2019 that was finally published I'm dying to get the scientist on, on on the show. It actually looked at uh, pitch competitions, and it would turn the quality of video down so that people were just silhouettes or turn it up, and it would mute the volume and do all of these wacky things. And if they could see the hand gestures and they could kind of see what the person's facial expressions are, they could get off of you know the PowerPoint plus the body language uh, what the person was trying to say, they were more likely to go for those pitches. Um, and so that's really fascinating to me. What what are these cues that we're, we're not even aware that we're just kind of throwing away because so much of us is down here? Um, you know, are there things that we can do to, to kind of lift those back up like our voices? Absolutely. And I am someone who, and I think you're, you're talking about gesticulation, the way we move our hands yeah. and, and the way that we're expressive. Um, I use my hands so much that I've actually trained myself to keep my hands sometimes below the camera because before, <laughs> when I first started making video, I was just all up here moving around and it was just a lot of hand gestures that weren't always useful to proving my point. But then when I was filming my course for LinkedIn Learning, they one thing they said to me is, Jamie, we need more hands. And I was just thinking like, I've been sitting on my hands. I'm trying to keep my hands down. They're just gonna run away with themselves. But all of this just comes back to practicing and something that we can do in preparation for events like this is just record conversations that we're, we're having with our family or friends. So if you're at home and you're about to tell your spouse, child, family member about your day, just set up your phone camera just somewhere and and film yourself so you can watch how you move naturally. And then after, after you watch that, maybe you see that you already are really great at using your hands to prove a point or to paint the picture that is your story. If you're not, then you can practice this on camera by yourself where you're, you practice telling the same story that you just told to your family and try to use more hands. And something that we can think about when, when we're not sure about where do hands go and how do I best use them to articulate my point, look at singers that are really good performers and you'll find them doing these, these little hand movements like when they're doing the runs and they do this like little hand thing. Because this is something that happens a lot with singers and with actors where we use movements or gestures to remember certain things. And so rather than remembering to use your hands, use your hands to remember different parts of your story. And so for me, for instance, when oh. I'm talking about something and I'm talking about different, I'm talking about a list, I'll start up here. And I do this, I do this unconsciously, but this is something that I think is I, and you know, I was an, in acting for years and I was a dancer and I was doing all these different things. So it's just normal to me, but 
using like use, using your hand to identify a list can be good. So I'll say the first thing, and then the second thing, and then the third thing, and then the fourth thing. And so using those different levels makes what you're saying a little bit more interesting, but it's not like you have to come up with some creative gesture or this and that. It's just something that is, it's, you're using it to facilitate and, and to, to help add to the point you're making versus the other way around. So it's adding to the story rather than using it in spite of the story. Yeah, I mean, I think a good way to think about that maybe is um, it's intentional. You know, the, the example you gave of your family, if I talk to them about something that happened, I, I normally point to whatever that location is, um, even if it's, you know, somewhere at work, miles away. I point in that general direction. And I think we all do that um, kind of on a subconscious level. So that that's a really, it's a really interesting point to make. I, I do like this kind of um, fires together, wires together mentality of... Um, using those hand gestures that's that's a really good point do you I think like that fires together wires together yeah yeah it's a um a neuroscience um saying uh, so would you would you say that there are other kind of key things outside of spending gobs of money on equipment that people can do or, or you know even event planners can look for in their speakers are there a few keys that maybe would help them discern how compelling this person is going to be on camera for an audience who is already tired of sitting through meetings halfway through the day or what, what, what would you kind of look for? Looking for speakers who are already posting video content to social media is a great place to start. But I also think that there are a lot of very compelling speakers who maybe you would miss out on because they don't post a lot to social media. So one of the things that I suggest is when Normally when, when you invite a speaker to an event, you have a form that they fill out, they put links to their content, their headshot, their bio, any number of things. But what you can also do is have them submit a, a three to five minute video and have them tell a story about anything versus their topic because you know that they're well-versed in their topic. They don't need to prove to you that they know what they're talking about. You want to see how they are on camera. And so ask them to tell you about a favorite memory or a favorite vacation. And this is actually an exercise that I use to teach people to be more animated when they're telling stories because if people are talking about something they're interested in then their face is going to light up they're they're remembering these experiences that they have they've had and so there's going to be more energy and light within them so that's a great way to see how a person might present themselves and another thing that you can do also is have a preliminary event where maybe you film something for your Social, for a social media channel where you have a conversation and you invite multiple speakers to come speak and on a topic that they're all well versed in. And so you can see ahead of time on your social media channel, what they're like, what is their present like and presence like in front of the camera and what are they like when they're talking about this thing that they're well versed in. So now you have this video of them telling a story that they're passionate about and you've seen them on your channel. So you can compare what they're like when they're talking about different things things. And that's a great way to sort of get the energy for people. It's, it's all about testing because everyone has something magical to share and everyone has this amazing energy. It's being able to bring it out of people. And we're all, last year was a, a new experience for just about everyone. So we're all getting used to some more of us than others being on camera and, and being comfortable and confident. But Truly, with, as with everything, the more experience we get, the better that we get. And the more feedback we're able to receive and receive well, the more we're able to improve. Yeah, those are good points. You know, I like the um, the part about having them tell a story. We actually use that when we're doing tech checks um, because we find that people have more inflection in their voice and their, their range of volume shifts more if you ask them a personal question, especially from childhood. Um, yes. They'll actually become more animated. They're louder. If they're using a, a mic that's on board a device, they tend to get closer to it because they want you to hear the story. It, it's an amazing thing to watch um, when you think through everything that's not even consciously going through that person's mind. But that is that is a good technique for sure. Um, wow. So I guess I would just ask you, you know, is there anything I forgot? <laughs> I mean, there are so many, there are so many different things to consider when it comes to, 
to increasing your confidence. I think um, maybe we could talk about on the other side is sort of our internal monologue that we have while we're the ones speaking versus testing the waters of someone who might come to speak for us is thinking about, especially now we've all been so isolated for so long, the voice that we're hearing most frequently as always, but especially now is the voice inside our heads. And depending on how we were raised and the environment we were raised in, that voice can sound a lot of different ways. And the voice that you hear inside your head is a copy of how your parents spoke to you or whoever raised you as a child. And so that sometimes that voice can be pretty unpleasant. And so being clear on what's going on in your head makes a big difference when you're performing because we all have the ability to present ourselves in different ways. And when we can go up on stage having, or you know, in front of the camera, having had the worst day of our lives, but if we're able to center ourselves and realize that, that this is just a moment in time that we're passing through and that even though, even though we're feeling poorly and we're presenting ourselves in this positive way, we're not being fake. And that's that's something that I've spoken to a lot of people about recently. You know, I'm, I had a really bad day and then I'm going to speak at this event or I'm performing um, at this event or I'm posting this video and I'm acting in a way that does not reflect how I feel and being fake. And I always tell them to just rein it back in. Like, you're not being fake. Everyone, it's not, everyone doesn't have the honor and the privilege to have an inside look into your personal life every single day, you get to decide what you share. And just because you're feeling something very deeply, it doesn't mean that changes who you are and what you're about. And putting on a happy face doesn't mean that you're lying because you've been happy in your life. And just because you aren't at this very moment, that's okay. But another thing to consider too, is that because we're all collectively dealing with the multiple stages of grief, we're all at different stages, but as a human race, we're all grieving for our past, how our life used to look. And we, we all are navigating that it's okay to bring up how you feel. And that actually can help you connect with your audience even on a deeper level. But in that sense, something to remember is whenever you're talking about something that is personal, something that's going on with you, the best way you can do that is to offer your audience actionable steps that they can take if they're going through the same thing, even if you're not totally through it, because there's a difference between emotional dumping and venting and sharing a story in a way that's going, that's going to help. So saying that I'm going, I'm feeling really bad today. You know, I'm feeling very isolated. I'm so glad to be here. But if you notice my energy is a little different, it's because of this, but some things I've noticed that can help me get out of this are X, Y, and Z, or there was a time where I felt this way and I'm still feeling the resistance residuals. And here are some things that I did in order to get through this. So explaining why you're telling the story and giving people steps that they can take if they're going through the same thing. It's all about connection and feeling connected and finding a way to reach out to the people that you're speaking with, because whichever story we're telling, and this is something that, that really resonates deeply with me and took me a while to understand also is that even though we're telling our story, the hero of our story is our audience. And that just means if they can't put themselves in our shoes, if they can't find a way to relate, the story isn't going to resonate with them. And then we're just speaking out into the ether and there's no connection. But if we can speak in a way that connects and allows them to step into our shoes, then that's, that's where the deep connection, the energy, the inspiration comes from. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so true. I think, um, a lot of people are dealing with stuff, and I, I do think all of the best presenters that I've worked with and seen, um, they've always, you know, dealt with whatever was in the room, whether it was them or a kid comes in the room or <laughs> a pet or whatever. You acknowledge it. You make it part of what's going on. You don't just try to brush it aside. And, and by doing that, you actually, I feel like, bring the audience closer in. So I, I really appreciate that. You know, I, yeah. I could talk about this all day <laughs> or all night. <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. So I would just ask you uh, if I could, before we go, can you give me three books that you think our audience should read? Absolutely. So the first one that I suggest is Essentialism by Greg McCowan. This is a great book that focuses on 
the ability to say no and how create how we have a certain amount of energy that we have to expend every day and by creating these boundaries we're able to be the best versions of ourselves and get respect from the people by setting those in place um the second book is one of my favorite books and it's a fiction book, but I learned something new from it. I read it every single year. It's called Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And it talks about a society that is, it's, there's this very strict set of rules. Everyone is decanted. So they're grown in test tubes and it's, everyone has a set place. Um, there's alphas, betas, gammas, deltas, and they all function in different ways and they all relate to each other in different ways. And it's, it's a great way to get perspective on how people think and how our experiences, our collective experiences, get us to where we are and allow us to formulate our opinions and um, the way that we think. And then the last book is uh, The Four Agreements by Don, Don Miguel Ruiz. This is one of my favorite books too. It talks about the making these four agreements with ourselves that allow us to be the best version of ourselves. Um, and I, I read it every couple of years and it's, it's a great way, especially now when we're in this world that feels very uncentered to recenter yourself and, and also again, create boundaries to live a healthy life and to create a mindset that allows you to feel comfortable with yourself and feel proud of who you are. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining Absolutely. us. Uh, everyone, you please, uh, you know, come back next Thursday. We'll have another great episode. Um, if you are using Zoom for your events, there will be a checklist that you can grab uh, through a link in the description below. Also, check out the link for Jamie. She is doing some great things. You should check her out on LinkedIn and uh, stay in touch. Thanks. Thank you.